Hello, everyone. Dave Lander here from DaveLander.com, and this is the week in charts. I'm sure I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. If you would like to attend live and you're watching this on YouTube, obviously, or my website, go to DaveLander.com, and usually on the home page, there is a sign up on Thursdays. And if it's not there at the top, scroll down to the bottom, and I'll make sure. I get that in there from now on. All right, what are we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, I have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, wait until we get to the live charts on that, just so my ADD doesn't wander off. Your favorite stock picks, and again, wait until we get to the live charts on that. In other words, wait until we're through the slides. And when we get there, and this is for your benefit, just ask about one ticker. At a time. So what are we talking about? Well, I want to follow up a little bit on volatility. I started playing with volatility this morning. I said, Dave, don't go down that rabbit hole. So there's just a couple of things I wanted to point out, which I think are relative, uh, or relevant, I should say, to the, to the current market conditions. One cup of coffee more, Dave. And I think it's I think it's some good news in a way, and I'll flesh that out in just one second. And if you want to know more about volatility and if you can't sleep at night, go in and watch last several weeks of shows where I really got, in, got into that volatility rabbit hole. Volatility is good stuff, but it can have a little bit of a holy grail feel to it if you're not too careful. Before you know it, you could spend a lot of time on it. I spent a few years actually studying volatility, and it was not all a waste of time or an exercise of futility. I did learn a lot in the process. I want to come back to some very simple stuff to stay with the trend. Sort of last minute, I began thinking about some of these things and I wanted to show you this week. And one thing I woke up thinking about this morning was the sell in May thing, the old Wall Street adage, sell in May and go away. I want to discuss that a little bit. Before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as I'll have to sum it up, all predictions or about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. That comes from my buddy, Greg Morris. I have been doing these bear market updates. And in my newsletter, I changed it to bull market updates. And then the market tanked <laughs> a couple days later. But uh, I have, if you go to my website, you can get those bear market updates. And lately, it's just been the, the latest uh, webinars that I've been doing. And I'm working on them. Uh, random thoughts column that should be there soon or on the home page but go there and check it out and that's on my home page now getting back to volatility real quick one thing i'm continuing to notice is longer term volatility is continuing to drop but shorter term volatility is rising which i think is a good thing if you've been trading for a couple of years, you probably know that sometimes summers can be really thin and choppy and it's hard to trade. And volatility is our friend. Yeah, we'd all like a longer term bull market where volatility is kind of low and the market just tends to go up day after day after day. And that's great. That just doesn't happen all the time. And it's really been a trader's market for 2020, although we did have a little bit of that low, nice climb, obviously coming into the year. And then the wheel sort of came off. Now, last week and weeks prior, I talked about the longer term volatility and how the curve has been flattening on that. And the reason it's been flattening is because the big bear market spill that we had, those days are beginning to come off. And then these little up movements that we've had for the past few months are beginning to get added in. Now, Volatility doesn't care about direction, but as a general thing, they slide faster than they glide. Now, I know my pilot friends are going to say, Dave, when you glide, you actually go down. Well, just work with me. How about this? What's the old saying? They take the escalator up and the elevator down. Stocks, that is. But anyway, due to the drop-off effect, that's why the longer-term 50-day volatility has been coming off more slowly. And the point I've been making in prior presentations, if you look at the very, very short term volatility readings, three, five, six, 10, and 20 days, they dropped off much more quickly because the extreme days were coming off 
of the reading. And then again, the longer term volatility after we saw that flattening of the volatility curve began to implode. And two, two reasons, again, why that happened. The first, I just said that the more volatile days of the bear market slide are coming off. And then two, the more orderly, less volatile days, for the most part, are being added in. Now, here's a good thing that I've been noticing is that the shorter term volatility is picking up a little bit. And volatility is our friend. Sometimes you, it sucks if you're long and the market goes the wrong way. But as a general statement, as a trader, volatility can be your friend. So just want to point out to you that the volatility is picking up. I know it's pretty obvious, but I think that this will be important to us throughout the summer if this volatility can continue to kind of hang in there longer term and maybe rise a little bit over the short term. Okay, speaking of trading summers, often you feel like you trade all summer long and then you realize that your equity has actually gone down and it could be quite frustrating. And I remember a few years back, I had a crappy summer in the trading service, and I don't remember which year it was. I could probably go back and look and tell you. I'll tell you once we look at some of these stats in a minute. And a client texted me or emailed me, I guess, on September 1st and reminds me of how crappy my performance is. By the way, you don't have to tell me when my performance is crappy because <laughs> I know. And he said, everyone knows that you sell in May and go away. It's kind of like, okay, well, if you knew that, why did you bother trading yourself into a hole and following me? Because I'm such a dumbass, right? Well, it might not be that simple. So should you sell in May and go away? Let's take a look at a couple things. Let's take a look at our current market because obviously May has just come and gone and now we're halfway through June. So, so far, we had this really nice run in the market. The market ran 15% from May 1st to June 8th, or well, 14%. And then, and based on last night's close, we're up 10% so far for the month. 10% is nothing to sneeze at. If we could hold, let's say, 3,100-ish round numbers, or 3,100 round numbers, that means that we're up 10%, let's say if we could hold until September, for the summer. A lot of times the market doesn't move 10% in a year. And usually if a market goes up 10% in a year, that's probably a pretty good year, as long as it's not too choppy. As long as it doesn't go down 20%, then up 10%, then down 20%, and then up 30%, and you know, zigs and too many zigs and zag. to really frustrate the trend follower. Now let's go back to last year. And you can see we did have a little spill in the beginning of May and the market dropped 6.7, six and three quarters percent. You're like, you know what? That selling May thing does make a lot of sense. I'm glad I sold in May. But then it ended up two or three quarters percent. And the recovery on that was pretty impressive. So it had to go up against, uh, I can't do the math exactly in my head, but it's probably about a 10% rally to make up that six and three quarter percent loss. But then by the end of May, you were down a little bit more than the half of a percent. So it's like, well, that might've been a summer where it's okay to sell in May. But we go back to 2018 and there were some zigs and zags, but squint your eyes and for the most part the market went up and it went up 9.39 percent that's almost 10 percent move that's a pretty good summer that's good enough to likely catch a few trends obviously and possibly regret selling in may and going away now let's turn this on its head what would happen if you bought in may so buy in may and go away so we're up 10 percent so far in 2020 and then we were up 
five percent in 2019 as you just saw 9.39 percent in 2000 and 18 and then 2017 we were up 3.67 percent and we go to 2015 down five percent and change 2014 was up 6.34 percent 2013 up 2.2 two two percent so basically what we're doing here is just so you know the trading system so to speak is the last day of april whatever the trading day is if it's april 30th then we would buy on that day if it's falls if may 1st falls on a weekend or whatever or i should say if the last day of april doesn't fall on a trading day the last trading day of april we're going to we're going to buy so we are long on May 1st, and then we're gonna sell on the close of April 31st. So buy the night before, so to speak, or the close before May 1st, and sell on the close of August 31st, or the last day of August, obviously. And then going back to 2012, eh, it went up a tiny, tiny bit. So you can see out of the last, what is that, about eight years, there was one down year out of eight years by selling in May and going away. So you'd have missed some pretty big moves going back those eight years. And if you started investing in this system back in 2012, you would have made 40% on your money, which that ain't too bad. You're just getting long. You're just long three months of the year. So that's pretty good, right? But Dave, what about 2011? That summer sucked. Yeah, I forgot about that. You're right. We were down 10.61%. It's amazing. I forgot about it. I was able to put the slide together this quick on the fly. <laughs> so yeah, so even with that, you still have 27% trading this system. So for nine years, you'd make 27% trading three months a year or actually making one trade round trip, making one round trip a year. All right, 27.7%, it's almost 28%. That ain't too bad, right? Still ain't too bad. But Dave, what about 2010? That summer sucked too. Yeah, it did, you're right. So we were down 11% in 2010. This number, right, this should be 2010 right there. So you might have a point, but still 11.27% of selling in May and going away. Eh, it's better than the poke in the eye. Now, whenever you, so let's just go back one more year to 2009. And in 2009, the market went up 16.75%. That's a pretty substantial move. And when you do the math on everything, you're back to a 31% plus return. So that ain't too bad for selling in May and going away, going back the last 11 years or so. Now, whenever you start playing fun with statistics or fun with math or fun with markets or fun with charts, you gotta always get back to buy and hope, right? What would happen if you did nothing other than put your money in the market and go about your life? Well, you'd have made. 263%. Oh, Lord. That's impressive, right? Wow. Fantastic. Okay. So if we bought on the close of April 27th, 2009, and we held until yesterday's close, we would be up 263%. Well, that sounds like a pretty good argument for buy and hold. Well, unfortunately, that'll work until it don't. Let's say you had a kid in the mid 90s and the stock market is doing pretty good and you're like, you know what, I'm gonna have to get around to investing some money for Junior so he can go to college. But damn it, the minivan just dropped its transmission and this kid is expensive. He won't stop pooping. I gotta buy an S ton of diapers and we have all these expenses and you know we probably need to get a nice little house for junior 
and boy, that's expensive. And we need a down payment for the house. And there goes all our savings. And geez, there's just not a whole lot of money to go around. So before you know it, Junior's five or six years old. And you're thinking, well, I better start investing in his college fund. And he's ready to go to college sometimes in 2009. And now the buy and hold investment is down 54%. So as I preach, buy and hold will work until it don't. Now, before I digress too far, let's get back to the sell in May thing. So as you can see, there's some pretty impressive summers here that seems to go against the sell in May. Yeah, 2010, 2011, a couple other years in there, you might rethink it a little bit. But you would miss some really, really big years. And there were a few mediocre years in there, five and six percent over a summer. That's really not that bad of a move if you think about it. Now, we did have a couple of bad years in here going back 10 years or so, 11 years. But look at those really bad months. Market was down almost 12% and almost 11% respectively. You got to remember that we do know how to short stocks. Now, as I often preach, you're not going to get rich on the short side, at least unless the bear market continues for a long, long time, which usually and fortunately they don't. So we can start getting long again, which is much, much easier. Not easy, but easier than trading a bear market. But even though the market went down hard, we know how to short. And we could short stocks during those really bad periods. So the point I'm trying to make is there is an outlier effect with trend trading. And that means that a lot of your big gains come from a few positions. And you don't know when those positions are going to set up. As I often say, you must be present to win. So part of the genesis for this presentation today was obviously because somebody told me that I sucked a few years back when the market just chopped back and forth and ended up probably down a little bit or up a little bit for the summer. And the trend following thing really didn't work so well. And the other inspiration was Tom McClellan gave a really great presentation a few years back at the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts meeting in New Orleans, and he talked about the sell in May and go away thing. And he actually showed that, if memory serves, there's actually a slight edge to selling in June and going away. But one of the points he made, which I think is more important, is that he's like, why is there this myth out there? And the reason is that things that rhyme tend to be believed. And his example was, if the glove doesn't fit, like Johnny Cochran said, glove don't fit. You must quit. It's the Chewbacca theory, okay? Everybody knows about the Chewbacca theory? Chewbacca, he a big Wookiee. He lives on the, uh, what, where does he live with Ewoks? I forget the name of the planet they live on, but it makes no sense. Chewbacca, big old Wookiee, Ewoks, little bitty people. <laughs> anyway, the Chewbacca theory is what got OJ off. Google it if you get bored. As Tom McCollum pointed out, and I often point out, be leery of common wisdom, okay? Be leery of these Wall Street adages. I think buy low, sell high has ruined many of lives. Although I have to say, lately it's worked quite well. But be careful of, again, common wisdom. And don't forget, you have charts. Just in case I get hit by a beer truck, learn how to play with them. And, and I, for some reason, lately I've been thinking about, okay, I'm not going to be on this planet forever. What could I leave as my legacy? What could I leave as far as simple trend following that you younger folk can take the ball and run with? What can I leave to where you won't get caught up in these crazy Wall Street adages? And maybe one thing that's got me thinking about some of this, not my mortality as much, but just in general and, and rewinding some of my presentations back to the utmost basics some of the stuff i've been doing in my stock charts show at stock charts tv 
stockcharts.com is really simple things like trying to explain to people, especially since there's all these newbies, everybody seems to have the Robinhood app on their phone. And all these newbies are trying to buy low and sell high. And they're trying to interject all this logic into the markets. And then a lot of them are having this newfound success. They start off and they immediately become successful. And then they think that the markets will always be this way. And I've covered this in a lot of painstaking detail over the last couple of weeks. And I'm hoping I didn't bore everybody to death too much because the new traders, that is, because I think that if they pay attention to what I'm really trying to say, they could be a trader for life. But don't believe, don't believe me. Don't believe anything, right? Go out and noodle with it yourself and come to your own conclusions. So work to turn conventional wisdom on its head, buy and hold. I read this morning where somebody said, in a, and this is a little bit older book, I don't know what year it was written, that the market has never had a rolling 12 years where it didn't go up. I don't know about that. I'm pretty sure that we had some pretty ugly periods in the past. And if memory serves, I think we went 20 something years without making new highs. So yeah, some of those statistics might be true, but do you really have 12 years, okay? Junior, let's say Junior's ready for college. You're like, hey, hold off, Junior. We gotta wait another 12 years before we could send you to college. So I would work to turn conventional wisdom on its head. Don't believe some of those statistics. I think Greg Morris said it the best when he said that these buy and hold metrics are based on an 81-year time horizon. And as I said in Trading Full Circle, and so my intro material, as Sweet Brown says, ain't nobody got time for that. Now, the other thing you need to realize, and I just look back 11 years, this is not a representative sample, okay? And by the way, and this is why I'm not a big fan of seasonal trading, because let's say you're looking at the last 100 years or so, maybe 120 years of seasonal trades, something could be statistically valid, and let's say the next four or five years, it just fails miserably. Well, it could still be statistically valid. It just didn't work for a while. So this sell in May thing really didn't work so well for 10 years. Doesn't mean that there's still a tiny edge in there that it might work, right? So be careful with that. Anytime you're looking at a small sample, and I'll give you an example of a small sample. I look back to what would happen over the past several months, going about a month ago, looking at the spiders and some of these other directional uh, direction funds, ETFs, ledger, leveraged ETFs. So it's a very simple trend following, some of which I'm going to show you here in just a second. And it absolutely would have printed money, like on a five minute chart. Just amazing. Okay. But I knew in the back of my head, volatility was whack. Okay. Crazy high volatility. And that's why it worked so well. So I knew in the back of my head, that I didn't have a true representative sample. And what I was studying was a church of what's happening now. Now I did apply a little real money, real markets. I tend to be a little too quick to do that. And I probably should, shouldn't admit it, but I do get a little anxious sometimes to apply these things. But in the back of my head, I knew that volatility was coming off and I had to be really careful. And it worked really well for a while. And then it hasn't worked as well in more recent times. And I went back to just picking my spots carefully and doing things like opening gap reversals for the ETF type of trading, uh, day trading that is, intraday trading. Anyway, long story endless, the anomaly I recent witness that I recently witnessed with this ETF trading is a bit of an anomaly based on the extreme volatility. Now, getting back to the sell in May thing, you gotta remember that we do play for the outliers again, you miss a few big trades and your 
year could be blown. And that's one of the things I can I haven't yet to solve for, but I'm working on it. Unfortunately, if I do solve for that, you'd probably never see my fat ass again. But there is an outlier effect. And as I've said before, I gave a seminar once or spoke once. And the peer, one of my peers who invited me to speak, he critiqued me a little bit after the show. And he, he tends to do that. And that's okay. I mean, I can learn from him. And he said, you make it sound a little too elusive by using the word streaky. Well, it is, you know, and I don't want to sugarcoat anything and make it look easier than it is. But you miss a few outliers and your performance is mediocre at best. Sometimes, as I say, I nausea him. I've seen it recently. Sometimes when I'm doing really well in the trading service, making very good recommendations, and there's not a whole lot of guesswork involved because there's not a whole lot of discretion involved and things are going really well and I have a few stinkers, I lose people on the service. And I'm like, well, why'd you quit? I think we're doing pretty good. Well, usually it goes like this. Why'd you quit? Well, I can't make any money. It's like, geez, you know, you didn't get that ABC. It's like, that thing really took off. Well, I didn't take that one. But what about XYZ? No, I didn't take that one. Well, they took all the other stinkers, but they didn't take the few that, that went off. And that's something that I haven't solved for other than work hard in my stock selection. All those things I talked about for 14 hours in a stock selection course. So in a lot of things, a lot of the more basic things we cover here week in and week out, like I just go in and if you get really bored and can't sleep at night or whatever, quoting my friend Greg Morris, he's joking about his stuff, but I'll joke about mine. Don't operate heavy machinery afterwards, but notice the stock picks that people ask about and then notice what I say. Simple things like, well, number one, it's not trending or it has overhead supply that's going to cap your gains or it's a little wide and loose. Why not go with something more cleaner in the sector? So there's a lot of things you could do to help eliminate some of those stinkers, but obviously you can't get rid of all of them. And I remember when I first started programming my first systems and I started barely getting profitable with some of these systems and I began thinking well you know if I could just figure out a way to filter out all the losers that would be really great I didn't realize that's a holy grail hunt anyway before I forget about the sell in May thing summers can suck again but we must be present to win and if you don't want to be here during the summer I will stay here all summer long and you can follow along with what I'm seeing and if I'm not saying anything, you can continue to enjoy the beach. And you only have to trade when I begin seeing some trends develop. Now, in my Trading Simplified shows over at Stock Charts, I did a presentation recently where I talked about the light and the light is good. And stay in the light, the light is good. And that's Landry light, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average for uptrends. Or the highs are less than the moving average for downturn. But they what moving average. Well, I've noodled quite a few of them. If you're doing longer term market timing, the 50 day simple average on a weekly chart works pretty darn good with this daylight thing. On shorter period charts, a 20 day EMA, and lately I've been messing around a lot with a 30 day EMA or 30 period EMA, and that's been pretty cool. So here's a 30. EMA on the S&P 500. And here's my premise. Be bullish when 30-day Landry light turns green. Stay bullish until it turns red. In other words, hold through the neutral periods. And then be bearish until the 30-day Landry light turns green. So let's take a look at that. You can see back here that the, in my slides, got my slides crashed before the show, so some of the animations aren't there. But you can see back way back here, you can see we turn green or bullish, and the market had a nice little run higher. We did have one little kiss of the moving average. And by the way, I actually published a pattern. I think it was in 10 best, Day Landry's 10 best patterns and strategies. <laughs> I gave somebody both the books, and then they want, somebody's like, can you tell me, I don't want to have to read both of them. Can you tell me what the difference is? Like, oh, just, just read the books. You know, it's in there. But one of the patterns that wasn't in the first book was, I have three, by the way. 
and I might have put it in the third book, I forget. But anyway, I, I call it Kiss Mom Goodbye, Kiss Moving Average Goodbye, using a 20-day moving average, but I think it would work just as well, or maybe even better in some cases, with a 30-day exponential moving average. You can see that the Landry Light indicator up top, which counts the days of Landry Light, in other words, if it's on the upside, it stays green and counts each day it goes above or stays above the moving average as plus one. When it kisses the moving average, it resets back to zero. Or if it drops below and the high is below, then it turns red and then the count starts on the downside. But you can see we stay green for a pretty long time until unfortunately the market began to slide back in February. And then we had downside Landry Light for a long time. It felt like a long time, did it? And then you could see that we came back up and rallied. Now, if you take a look at the ribbon on the bottom, it was bullish and at worst neutral for a long, long time, okay? Going way back to October 2019 or so, that's when this last leg started under Nernus, and it lasted for a long, long time, up until February, right? So the big blue arrow pointed higher for that period of time. And then it turned bearish, obviously, in late February. And we had a pretty serious slide there. And then, once again, it turned bullish and has remained bullish since April. And it's gone neutral a few times. In other words, it's tagged that 30-day exponential moving average. But the premise I'm trying to make here is that the 30-day exponential moving average can contain trends really well, especially if you're using a little Landry light and you got maybe a little trend coming in. So let's say you get long a market, and it could be a five-minute chart, it could be a 30-minute chart, or an hourly chart, or a daily chart, or a weekly chart. And if you have daylight, or Landry light, I should say, on the 30 exponential moving average, then try to hang on to that market as long as you have that Landry light, or at worst, if it intersects the moving average and maybe makes a moving average pivot, meaning that it makes a low below the moving average and you got higher lows on both sides, just classical technical analysis 101, try to stay long that market. So here's your moving average, and let's say the price is here and then it drops down to here and then it rallies up to here. So this is the moving average pivot, okay? Downside would look like this. It rallies up, it tags that moving average, okay? Looks like this. Let me just redraw this. Let's say it looks like this, this, and then it comes back in, okay? So this would be the pivot to the upside. This would be a pivot to the downside. So here, going back to a real chart, you see you had all this daylight in here, or Landry light, I should say. You had this little test of the moving average, a little pivot, and what happened here? Well, this implodes because this is counting the, the days of Landry light. One day, two, three, four, five. And it just keeps climbing and climbing and climbing as long as you stay above the moving average. By the way, I'm not a big fan of trying to time a market with overbought, or oversold, or it's going up too long or down too long. But with that said, without talking about both sides of my mouth, when this number gets fairly high in here, 30, 40 days, and I've seen like 100 weeks on a weekly, then you better brace for a correction. Doesn't mean you want to sell your stocks, but you might want to honor your stops, and you also might want to make sure you're taking partial profits along the way. But anyway, getting back to this pivot concept, notice that you had Landry Light throughout, right? And then you had some pivots below that 30 EMA, okay? And then what happens here? Well, the high is less than the moving average, so the green turns from green to red, right? That's day one, day two, day three, day four, day one, day two, day three, day four, and so on and so forth, okay? And again, what happens? 30, 40 days, on the downside especially because it's harder to sustain trends on the downside because you have the big retrace rallies and all. And then what happens? It turns green again. And again, we've been green 
ever since. Lows are greater. Now we did have a little kiss here, a little kiss here. And then obviously last week, what happened, we had another little kiss of the moving average. I think if all you did, I don't say, I'm not going to say you could be a, the greatest hedge fund manager in the world or greatest trader in the world. But I think if all you did was pay careful attention to this Landry light and pick your favorite moving average, okay, and work to ride out these little corrections down to the moving average, I think you would do okay longer term. Now, way back here off the screen, there is some choppy periods. Of course, there would be some choppy periods. And, you know, it happens, right? But for the most part, I think you would do really well. All right, any questions on that? Indoor. What does that mean? <laughs> now, again, that research that I kind of hinted at a second ago, part of it came from looking at five-minute charts, and we've had this wonderful volatility for quite a while. Now, again, you don't want to rush out and, and, and just trade this, but go in and play with this, and you'll find it kind of cool. Now, the problem is you don't really have a true moving average in early trading, but after 30 periods, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So somewhere in here or whatever, then, then this average is a true average, but the EMA does catch up with the price pretty quickly. So it's probably at least 90% of where it should be. But the point is that even on like a five minute chart, if all you did was try to hang on, and let's say you got long some other pattern, Okay, say you had a bow tie or some sort of intraday pullback or even a moving average kiss like we just talked about. And if all you did was say, okay, I'm going to try to hang on best I can. Now, don't throw cross caution to the wind. If it busts through the moving average, it keeps on going. Then you can obviously have to get out. But for the most part, if all you did, you know, throw a caveat in, if the market is truly trending, if all you did was hang on to that stock, and allowed it to correct to that moving average, a 30-day exponential moving average, you would probably do pretty good into holding on to trends. I have a friend who's also a client, and he follows my stuff very well and does really well, but he also has an affinity for day trading, and he likes to scalp a lot. And given his busy lifestyle, entrepreneur, very successful business, and he just really doesn't have a whole lot of time and, and he probably has no business being scalping. So the point I'm trying to make with him is keep doing your position trading stuff, which he will through my stuff because he's been with me for 10 years. And if you're going to do this scalping thing or intraday thing, figure out a way to kind of make a shift to where you're trying to capture intraday trends and because a lot of times you'll go in and get a point or two on something and say, hey, look, I had a good day. You'll send me a screenshot. And I'm like, that's great. But you caught two points. You caught two points at a stock that went up 20 points or went down 20 points. You know, if you just would have went off to take care of your business after putting on that trade and have a stop below or above, whatever case may be, that. 30 periods EMA on a five minute chart, you would have caught a 20 something point move or a 20 point move as opposed to a one or two point move. Okay. So I, throughout the years, I've noodled with the intraday trend trading. I think day trading is a bad idea. It's too many decisions. And I remembered now, once I started doing this intraday stuff, this intraday trend following, and I bought that domain years ago too, just in case I could flesh this out further. But I remember what. I now remember why I don't day trade like I used to because it really takes its toll on you and I think it eventually will kill you. And the gentleman I was talking about, he did admit to me, he's a little older than me, not much, but a little. He did admit to me that he was trading the other day and got heart, heart palpitations. So, uh, you know, as I was telling him back and forth, it's like, you know, I think I can make this stuff work, but do I really want to be the richest man in the graveyard? Okay. Oh, indoor. Yeah, it's where the Ewoks live. Yeah, the problem is I I, I go off on a rant 
And then uh, it's like uh, that somebody answers something in my question. So, yeah, it makes no sense. See, Chewbacca, he lives on Endor, okay? And Endor is where the Ewoks live. And Ewoks, they're little bitty fellas. Chewbacca, he's a big old fella. <laughs> Chewbacca theory, yeah. <laughs> I love that. All right, Ed Phoenix says, I recall reading an article in Technically Speaking of the MTA that said the 44-day EMA was the best for SPY, as I recall. I think the quote was some time ago, but I think I think I have it right. Um, sure, you know, we'll take a look at that. Um, you know, bring it up when we get to the live charts. In fact, I can write it down. You know, I, I wouldn't go crazy trying to, and I guess I need to stop short of saying the word curve fit, but for lack of a better word. That a lot of time I used to spend years and years or spent years and years working a lot of mechanical systems, and I would always find myself trying to figure out what worked the best and what parameters worked the best. And I would run scan after scan after scan or test after test after test with with all kinds of parameters and optimize it until I figured out what worked the best. Well, the only problem with that is you are kind of fitting. You're fitting your curves to the historical markets, and the future markets will be different. Just like my little holy grail, my little intraday system here, using very simple stuff like just moving averages and Landry Light and things like that, little pullbacks, printed money, okay, a couple of months ago. But once I went into real markets, things changed quickly, volatility changed, and we had less trend days, okay? But every now and then, a big trend day really pays off. But I don't want to be the richest man in the graveyard. So instead of chasing stocks all day long, intraday, what I do is I just now wait for the patterns that set up on a daily chart, such as the opening gap reversals, and try, and try being the key word, try not to trade too much when I don't have a daily pattern behind me, when I don't have a little tailwind, or when people aren't caught on the wrong side of the market. All right. So... I know I probably beat the dead horse in here, but I just want to say, just remember that everything works better with trend. Like Ed just said, he read where it was a 44 EMA. I would I would bet to say that that works incredibly well as long as the market is trending. So my little holy grail system I just kind of came up with, and you know, it's nothing, it's no big deal. It's just kind of looking at little pullbacks, looking at some moving averages and some pullbacks and some daylight. Or Landry Light and Kisses and things like that. It worked great, but I think that the conditions were conducive and that the we had intraday trends. So just never forget everything works better with trend. I've been noodling with some different moving averages lately, and it's like I was at first I was amazed, and I was like, well, Dave, everything works better with trend. Your bow tie moving averages, proper water, Landry Light, all these things I talk about every week would have all caught the same trends. So I left, over, I left some of these random thoughts in from last week. We had that one ugly open last week, last Thursday, if memory serves, and all of a sudden, all the bears come out the woodwork. I told you so. It's the end of the world. And here we are again, or here we are now. We're doing okay since, for the most part. Do be prudent, though. Stops, entries. I'm amazed at how many times waiting for an entry has kept me out of trouble. Try to always resist hopping in at the market. Just use an entry order, even if I am doing some of that uh, wild ass day trading. And make sure you're taking those initial profit targets when blessed. We have one that's been on a run as of late, but doing really well. But it did have a pretty big correction. It's like it's it's when you take those initial profit targets when you have big up days afterwards. You're like, oh man, I wish I had a full position on. But when the market implodes a little bit, when that stock implodes a little bit, you're like, well, glad I didn't have a full a full position on it. So you have to be willing to take the good and the bad. P corrections are painful, but they're healthy for the market. It shakes out some weak hands. It shakes out some nervous Nellies. And that's good for the market longer term. And like I said last week, and I think I just kind of alluded to, it's like I found the key. Should be a U in there. Find the key. <laughs> Found the key, but they're changing the locks. And, and the key was that when you have extreme volatility like we had, 
some of this intraday trend following can be pretty amazing. And again, I don't want to make it sound like I'm, I'm hinting at some kind of amazing discovery. What amazes me is I've been at this 30 years and then the things just keep getting simpler or more and more simple. A lot of newly minted geniuses a while. I've seen a few of them nearly blow up. There's somebody we've been talking about in the Facebook group who's been making a lot of money doing these little low price issues and stuff. And he's been touting it and he's very entertaining, but uh, I think it'll work until it don't. But he has been beating the pants off the hedge fund managers. All right, if you're a gold member and I haven't reached out to every single one of you just yet, because we had a few people come in recently, but please join the Facebook group and I'll approve you right away. You do have to be a gold member and that's to keep the riffraff out. I'm half kidding. And my wife told me this is the best thing I've ever done in my career is start that group. And I, and I, I agree, it's been wonderful because Trading could be a really lonely sport, especially if you got people out there making it look easy, which it's not, okay? But you get to interact with other guys, and I've learned a lot from the group so far, so I appreciate all your all you guys and everything you do, and most of you are here today. That's why I'm talking to you. You can ask for help, and then to my surprise, a lot of the other members chime in and with the correct answers long before I'm able to answer, answer the questions. And then we haven't done a Q&A in a while. We will do one. I think I, I've got some questions started to stack up a little bit. A lot of trading problems people sent in that want to be figure out a solution for. So I'll have to schedule those one schedule this one fairly soon. And then I'll show signs and signals sometimes as they occur, such as open to gap reversals. Obviously, big open to gap reversal a couple of days ago. We had a few good looking trades on that. So I'll throw out those ogres or open to gap reversals. All right, let's get to the live charts. And if you guys want to start asking about individual issues, you can do so now. Before I forget, uh, Ed wanted to take a look, or Ed mentioned the 44-day EMA, and I'm sure it probably works just fine. All right, let's take a look at SP500. And he was saying that a 44-day EMA test out. All right, probably does. All right, we're going to go 44, 44, exponential. And let's make it orange. Well, let's do this. So let's take a look at what we just looked at with the Landry light. And let's get us a nice bright color here. Ed says 44 day EMA is a good EMA for the markets. Okay, well, let's start back about in October where we started a little stuff here we didn't even have a kiss here so we have landry light landry light landry light landry light a little bit of a kiss landry light oops bam right there okay so you know what's the little guy the little alpine guy and then i'm not a good yodeler i don't know why it does that so now after february right we have Landry light to the downside for a long, long time. And then the Landry light ended here and he started having some upside Landry light. Okay, lots of kisses. But then for the most part, upside Landry light, little kiss here. So I would venture to say that, yeah, 44 EMA is probably a good one to use. You know, it's like I've been looking at some of these different moving averages and then. I keep reminding myself that everything works better with trend, and then I come back to like the bow ties. Let's go back in time a little bit. Ed, was that a was that a weekly moving average or was that a daily moving average? Now let me just show you something here. It's probably it's probably good to show you the bad with the good, right? So the period before I started discussing, okay, you could say like, well, this looked pretty good here, but then it's like this would be short. And it just kind of chopped around, chopped around, chopped around, and then you'd be long again. And then what happened? Oh, you would short again. So it gets kind of crazy in here. And one thing that I've done a lot of research over the years is when it starts getting choppy and say, okay, well, this is my low, and I'm not going to short until we take out this low. Or if I'm long in a longer term system, 
I'm not going to sell until we take out the, the slow establish. And then if it chops the upside and then back down again, it's like, okay, well, you know, let's just look at this trading range and say, as long as we're in this range, we might not want to do anything. It's like, aha, we discovered that the market is choppy. But yeah, what Ed said, going back to December of 2019, we had that bottom. And then what happened? You had some nice, nice, nice Landry light. Now, just for shits and giggles, let's do this. Let's let's leave Ed's moving average on there. Now let's add in a, and I have no idea what it's going to do, but I have a pretty good idea what it's going to do. I have a premise. So let's make it some kind of uh, color, crazy color. Let's do, let's do like a, a green. And let's go with a 30. Okay. All right. So Ed said 44 day works good. We take my premise of the 30 day EMA, same sort of idea. Okay. So 30 day EMA would have gotten you along back here a little early, right? And then the green, you had a little kiss here, but you had lots of Landry light and then lots of Landry light. Okay. And here's your little kiss. And then, you know, you probably would have gotten out maybe one day sooner with the 30, okay? But keep in mind, you might get a little bit more whipsaw with it. Then you can see they both kind of came together here, upside Landry light, and then the chop, they're almost the same, right, in this chop. Now, let's just do something real quickly, and then I promise I'll, I'll get off of this kick. But, you know, I'm glad you did that. You know, I'm glad you mentioned that. So this is, uh, this is good stuff. So let's go back to this period that we just discussed in the slides, okay? And you can see there's not that big of a difference between the two, okay? So everything works better with trend. If the market's trending, and this is a little chop we looked at back here, so let's forget about that. But notice this whole uptrend here, okay? You're above the 30 EMA, you got a little kiss here, you didn't even touch the 44. You're above it all the way here. You got a little kiss here, but you didn't break down, didn't have Landry light, and then you actually did kiss the 44, okay? And then you begin to break down. You had Landry light on the same exact day. We had such a big gap down, both the 30 and the 44. I don't know why it does that. But you had Landry light on both the 30 and the 44. And then here you had upside Landry light on this day here. And then it took the 44 a little bit longer to catch up in that particular case. But for all intents and purposes, this last leg up and pretty much every little leg we've looked at so far, 30 or 44 doesn't make a difference. Somebody's calling me. How many times do I have to tell you? Every Thursday I do a webinar. <laughs> Neighbor was looking for me earlier. He's, I, I know he need, needs help with some stuff. And, Are you available? It's like, no. <laughs> what day is it? What time is it? I'll get these people trained someday. All right, let's do this. Let's start looking at the market. And let's start off with the, the overall market. And we'll take a look at some sectors in here. First of all, S&P 500. Kind of a little bit of a flattish day in here. We nearly closed this gap right here, okay? But not quite. We tried. So I would like to see us close that gap. And while we're wishing, I'd wish we just go on the new highs. I wish we'd close this gap and go on the new highs. But you certainly can't argue with the fact that the market has headed higher. As of late, again, add in your favorite moving average. You know, today's moving average du jour is a 30-day EMA for me. And lo and behold, it's held really well. The 20 EMA was one of my favorite moving averages, and it still might be. And that kind of launched my career because I did a an article based on some mechanical testing in the Japanese yen versus US dollar. And I did that back in 19, oh, I'm going to date myself here, 1995, 
and I think the article came out in either 95, 96, it was like in December, and it was a 220 EMA breakout system. And all I was looking for was two days of Landry light and a high below the, above those two highs for longs and two days below the 20 day EMA and uh, low below those two lows for an entry. If you used to, used to cost a dollar 50, but I think it's been proliferated around the internet so much. I think you could probably get it for free. I'm not saying copyright infringe anyone, but uh, stockcharts.com has a copyright to that. If you get it from the website, I think they'll charge you a dollar fifty, a dollar forty nine. But it's just out there on the on the internet, so you can find it. Two twenty EMA breakout system, and it was used in the Japanese yen in my testing. Anyway, back to this. You can see so far we worked our way higher. I sure would like to see us get past this prior peak in here. That would make me feel a heck of a lot better. One thing with double tops is, and let's not be negative. I was gonna be a pessimist, but it wouldn't I figured it wouldn't work out, right? That's Stephen Wright. I had all these quotes that I was quoting a friend of mine who I thought was the funniest guy in the world. And then I met somebody who knew Stephen Wright, didn't know Stephen Wright, but was aware of Stephen Wright. And every time I'd quote something, thinking I was funny, he's like, that's Stephen Wright. I'm like, oh, okay. Anyway, double tops. If you whip out your Classical technical analysis books, Schaubacher or Pring, and more modern classic would be Pring, Edwards and McGee, a little bit older. But that's what a double top is going to look like. Unfortunately, in the real world, the double top looks like this, okay? Or a double top looks like, gosh darn it, a double top sometimes looks like this. I don't know why it does that stalls short of the prior peak and then begins to implode. So we could be in one of those situations and I hope not, I know, hoping one end and you know the other, but hopefully we're not in one of those situations where we stall short of the prior high, okay? That would be a little bit of concern. Chart's getting kind of busy, huh? All right, let's take a look at the NASDAQ or as we used to call it, the NASQAQ. Anybody remember the NASQAQ? Go the quack. It was the NASQAQ that became the quack. Sweet little old lady I worked with years ago. She was in the trading and every now and then we talked trading together and she called the NASDAQ the NASQAQ. Look at the NASDAQ composite. You know, I'm just noticing my little 30 day EMA. Let's put an EDS EMA and see what it looks like. But I'm just noticing my little 30-day EMA, and it looks like Ed's did, did almost as well as mine. Let's just get back to the 30-day EMA. You know, another thing to remember with technical analysis, this is why you don't really have to plot 50 indicators, is a lot of indicators will begin saying the same thing. And some people believe in putting a lot of indicators, but it's like if the market is trending, the market is trending. You don't need a whole lot of indicators for that. In fact, just maybe use one or even none, at least initially. But if you look at the NASDAQ, what's pretty amazing, and I'm just seeing this for the first time, is look at the Landry light with that 30-day, why does it do this, anybody know? With that 30-day EMA, pretty impressive, okay? And on the downside, look at this. Look at that trend, it's huge. Even Tiny Elvis would think that's huge, right? All right, let's erase all this. All right, I don't want to digress too far. NASDAQ is obviously doing much better, or doing the best, I should say, out of all the indices. And we actually, believe it or not, I know, crazy, huh? We've made it to new highs. Now, hopefully, this isn't the higher peak double top we talked about earlier. But I'm going to give the market the benefit of the doubt. Air on the side of the trend. So the big blue arrow right now is pointing up. Let's continue to follow along with the big blue arrow. Russell 2000 doesn't look quite as good. And the Russell 2000 has been underperforming for a while. But the Russell looks okay, okay? For the most part, it's worked its way higher. And you've had lots of Landry light. You know, we did kind of break out, and then we came back to the breakout area. But that's okay. For the most part, and in general, it's working its way higher. Let's take a look at gold for a second. You can see gold off a little bit today. Gold has lost some, some, some steam as of late, easy for me to say. 
if we put in the bow tie moving averages, you can see, well, it's kind of flat in here, just kind of meandering around. But sideways, nonetheless. Gold commodity, a little bit different picture here. We're starting to see some shorts setting up. I saw one or two little low price cheapies that are set up to the upside. But for the most part, the big gold stocks are set up to the downside. And I think when I start seeing some cool intraday setups in something like the JNUG or JDUST, DST, JDST, I might start nibbling a little bit there. I have, truth be told, I have taken some intraday trades there based on some of this research I've done, but I'm learning to be a little bit more selective in that type of thing. But gold uh, stocks not looking so hot, even though gold the commodity kind of hanging in there. Some of these areas that have been left for dead at low levels have been coming back nicely as of late, last Thursday or whenever that big gap down was notwithstanding. But you see banks have bow tied up. They're trying to work their way higher. Airlines, let's take a look at airlines. You can see same sort of pattern, nice little bottoming action in here. I never thought in the world, I never thought I'd ever say, I want to buy airlines, right? But look at that, nice little bow tie in here, kind of cup and handily pullback. So that's looking pretty good. Make sure you wait for an entry. Somebody at Facebook group was talking about some of the Landry List stocks, how they had a fake out. That's okay. I like fake outs as long as I'm not caught in that fake out. Once the market fakes out, then you get a new entry. And the new entry for something like this would be above that high. Let's take a look at insurance is another one of those areas. Remember we shorted ACGL? We wrote it down forever. Well, not a lot of these insurance stocks. Let's take a look at ACGL. I think it's probably... So we shorted this one, stayed short forever, right? In fact, I've got it marked in here. Talked about covering and or, or more covering and then adding options on or selling the position to buy options. So check recent shows for that. But you can see bow tie up has pulled back in here. And look at that, mother of all fake outs, but so what? You know, if you didn't, you didn't get caught in this fake out, then look to enter above that high. So insurance companies have come back quite a bit. Real estate has been left for dead, sort of, but it's working its way higher as of late. Trading above that magical, I'm half kidding, 30-day EMA. Drugs have lost some steam as of late, but notice that they got back above these bow tie moving averages. So I wouldn't count drugs out just yet. In fact, on an individual issue basis, basis, I'm pretty bullish on these guys. Same thing with biotech. We kind of squeezed in on the bow ties, looked like it was going to roll over. And then, you know, we're one good afternoon away from all time highs here. Look at that, up uh, almost three quarters of a percent today. So, doing better, I would say. Health services, not doing quite as well. But for the most part, they've worked their way higher for quite a while in here. So, we'll have to keep an eye on this. I'm still liking some individual stocks within the sector. Defense, another one of those areas left for dead, but as a general statement, has bottomed out, working its way higher. Look at retail, okay? Look at that trend. It's huge, okay? Whole trend from way back in April contained by the 30-day exponential moving average. I get all excited about something like that, and then it's like, well, Dave, notice the proper order in the bow ties. The 10 is greater than 20, 20 is greater than 30. So whatever you want to use, not that Big Dave's a grand poobah, you know, you don't have to use whatever Big Dave's using. Just use your favorite indicator for trend and make sure you start off with a blank chart and draw a big blue arrow first. But obviously they're headed higher. Let's take a look at the transports. Another one of those areas overall left for dead along with the jets. And lo and behold, working his way higher. Looking pretty good. Dave, you were real bearish while you're bullish. Well, the market's going up, you know? Case closed. Computer hardware, or as I often call it, Apple, working its way higher in here. Notice that nice little trend contained by the 30 EMA software. You got hardware, you're gonna need some software, right? For your hardware. How's the song go? 10 grade 20, 20 grade 30. Nice little uptrend so far, just off of all time high. So far, so good for software. Let's take a look, take a look at the semis. Easy for me to say. Nice little uptrend in the semis, well above that 30-day EMA and only had a few tags of 30-day EMA since way back in April, okay? This is the moving average du jour, but, you know, let's not forget about the bow ties and the proper order of the bow ties because that works pretty cool too. Let's take a look at bonds. 
real quick. Bonds have been looking a little toppy, but lately they've been a little choppy. Okay. So I feel like Johnny Cochran, right? <laughs> so as you can see, kind of moving averages turn it back up a little bit. I wouldn't rush out and buy bonds. I think longer term, bigger picture, looks like a top remains in place there. All right, keep those individual stock picks coming. Let's go ahead and jump into the in fact, let's do that right now. Let's take a look at GEL. Yeah, this looks okay. Uh, I think that in the energies, there's a lot of stocks to look at. And you might be able to find something a little bit better, but I can't fault you on that, Ed. Or is that George? Hey, George, I can't fault you on that. Does have some overhead supply at 18, but hey, you know, if you got in around 10 and it made it to 18, I think you'd be doing okay. Let's see what the trend is. We have the moving average of cross over the upside and look at that 30. So, so far with the 30 day, you have a little trend, you know, maybe like whatever this, let's get a um, crossbar in here, you know, maybe an entry about 11 ish or so somewhere in there. But I think you could probably find something bottoming out in the indices. I don't know off the top of my head. I, I know everybody who's been in service for 10 years, but if you're in a service, take a look at some of those cheapies that are in the service Landry list today on that. All right, any more stock picks you guys want me to look at? Snap. You're welcome, Steve. Steve says, nice webinar. Okay, well, which way is Snap headed? Anyone? Bueller? Snap is headed higher, right? So we should be doing what? We should look to buy, but only on what? A pullback. Okay, so put that in your momentum list. And when it pulls back, let's take another look at it. We'll know it when we see it, okay? SELB, too much overhead supply. I love when you guys answer your own questions. Just don't completely get rid of me. Let's clean this chart up. Let's go back to a blank chart. Well, first thing I'm seeing longer term, it looks like electric cardiogram. So I'd be a little careful with that. Now I know I've showed some stocks recently and traded some stocks recently that did have some longer term electrocardiogram action, but the trend, they begin to trend in more recent times and look worthy. But to me, this is a little too wide and loose and all over the place. So let's say, let's say you're excited about biotech. Let's take a look at biotech real quick. Let's see if we can find something that looks better than that. Let's sort them by volume. Ooh, there's a plethora of these things, huh? What's the Germany meta guy? I learned a word from you, plethora. <laughs> well, good. I didn't learn much German from you, unfortunately. All right, wide and loose. Let's see, that's just too crazy. 236 on the HV. Uh, mRNA, look at, look at mRNA working its way back up. That's kind of interesting, okay? Knocked out. I mean, it's too crazy to trade, but interesting that that big old knockout move in there kind of sideways, that could kind of be a return to paradise, right? Where it takes off, comes back in, and goes all the way back up again. Gilead's all over the place. A lot of people, or some people saying, Dave, I want to buy some Gilead. It's like, well, it's kind of an electrocardiogram. I guess it depends whether or not their vaccine is working when for the um, COVID-19. Let's see if we can find something cleaner in biotech. This kind of catches my eye. It's a cheapie though, but you can see it's bottomed out. Kind of has that Phoenix characteristic to it. Probably also a bow tie. Yeah, it's a bow tie too. But let's find something cleaner that could be traded. Now see, this looks a little bit better, okay? Not quite as wide and loose. Maybe too many days in the pullback, but you can see it had some issues longer term, kind of wide and loose. Oh, I don't like this gap though. But in more recent times, let's take it off and pull back. But too many days in the pullback. Let's see if we can find some of the cleaner. Kind of all over the place. That one already took off. This is one that was on the Landry list recently, by the way. Notice how it kind of took off, came back in. A little wide and loose longer term, I know. But it's kind of gotten its act together more recently. And that's one I liked. But you can see a lot of choppy trading. Now, this looks pretty good. It's a cheapy, but still, it's pulled back in here. Kind of quite a few days in the pullback. but. But not bad, okay? Nice bottoming out. Does have some overhead supply around two. But if it makes it to two, you know, who cares, right? 
All right, let's just go through a few more of these. This is kind of interesting. It got his biotech. I think this is a weed stock. But you can see it's a little interesting, kind of bottoming out, a little wide and loose. Let's pass on that. Let's just see if we can find something real quick. This isn't bad. It's kind of a cheapie, but you can see it's worked its way off of lows and then pull back a little bit. I don't know, longer term, a little wide and loose. That's biotech overall, LabU. Let's see if we could find something real quick. I know there's something in here. Oh, here we go. What was that? Shoot, where'd it go? I lost it. Anybody know what that one was? All right, hang with me. Let's find something. Yeah, Jern looks pretty good. I mean, too many days in the pullback, but it's but you kind of get the idea. Thrust, pullback, thrust. That's what we're looking for, right? This one looks okay. You can see nice, nice uptrend beginning to pull back. A little choppy that pullback, but not too too bad. It's got some bad memories, but kind of kind of has gotten his act together as of late. And I'm kind of giving biotechs a pass on some of that wide and loose longer term behavior because the environment we're in is such that i think that these are worth a shot if they've been improving as of late provided you don't have a big fat mound of overhead resistance yeah alt that was the one yeah sort of same thing i mean kind of wild and crazy but but what do we have thrust kind of a pullback situation sgmo put that on your watch list that'll look pretty good in the future if it continues to pull back a little bit. Anyway, I think by now you kind of get the idea. You guys are throwing some out, some new ones out, so that's good. Like this one here, you know, it's kind of crazy. It's pretty extreme. Let's see what it looks like on a pullback. I don't know, HV 200. That might even be too crazy for Big Dave. Okay, yeah, UBX did hit the entry today. UBX, is that a biotech? I forget. I should know that on the fly. I think it's a biotech. Yeah, okay, so here, okay, perfect, thank you. Thanks for the reminder. So here's a stock, what do we have going on here? Okay, and this was the mystery chart in um, my stock chart show. So it's working its way higher, it's not too exciting back here, but then what happens? It begins to take off and then it pulls back, and that's why it's been on a Landry list for about a week, and it's shot up and taken off today, but I think it still looks fantastic. So yeah, that's the best looking biotech out there. You know, mortgage your house, put all your money in it. <laughs> I don't want to say the guy's name because I've seen him get on the wrong side of people. Ooh, geez, I want to get on the right side of him. He's got a million and a half Twitter followers, so ADVM. But yeah, I still like that uh, UBX, even though it's faked out this morning. In fact, I like it better now that it's faked out. So now that's no longer um pre-trigger okay this here's a problem with this stock okay what happened here it went straight up okay what has it done you know janet jackson what has it done for you lately it's just kind of worked its way slowly higher so i would pass on that maybe stick it on your watch list yeah jern we like we like jern i think yeah jern looks pretty good kind of reminds me a little bit about the tbio that looks pretty darn good. Good uh, good eye, Mark. Mark found that before I found it earlier, so we'll give him credit. Almost a high five on that. T Doc, uh, you're kind of trying to sound like Lucy, huh? Eh, it's kind of stalling at the prior high in here, so I would leave it alone for now. Okay. All right, any more? All right, here we go. All right, Elizabeth says not to mix issues with facts. UBS is working with some really interesting approaches to aging as a disease. If you're interested, read David Sinclair's lifespan. I think he is involved. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, I, that's awesome. What's Gan doing? Gan's a gambling stock, but uh, the aforementioned popular dudes all over this. We're along this one, full disclosure, but I think that his little minions are going to help push it higher, so that's a good thing. You're saying, oh, because it shows almost over, you want to look at AWH. <laughs> AWH, 
Yeah, it's uh, kind of a wild and crazy one. Yeah, that's too crazy even by Big Dave standards. Maybe on a deep pullback, okay? Zach gave me a pick, and then he realized that it was not worthwhile. Good job. GMBL, yeah, that's one that uh, I've been kind of taking a look at. It's kind of wild and crazy longer term, but in more recent times, it's starting to get its act together. And you can see it's run up or ran up, and then it's pulled back a little bit and trying to rally out of this pullback. I, I would leave it alone. It's just a little crazy. You know, and, and do you ignore some of this older behavior now that's become popular? And that's something I've been trying to wrestle with a little bit lately is this stock was much thinner and choppier a while back and then all of a sudden now it's in favor. AWH used to be VRML. Look at 390. I took it at 390 in the Landry list. Yes, good job. All right. All right, good job. Fantastic. Good. All right, TBIO. Yeah, TBIO we like. This is the, oh, I'm sorry. TBIO is from the recent Landry list. It just pulled back too many days and I decided to take it off. Conceptually, I think it's okay. You know, I'm, I'm debating this one and I actually had an order in earlier and I'm like, um, I violated my rules. I'm not having a plan going in for a position trade. And I thought it might be worth a shot. And I decided to go ahead and pull the order. And I, I just got lucky on that one. I didn't know it would come back in. But I think it still looks okay. And this is why I tell people to keep the old Landry list. I was involved with the trading service years ago. And I actually provided the picks for it. Or for most days, I provided the picks. And uh, our clients, they didn't know I was behind the scenes. But our clients would often say that they found two or three days later the picks, and this was for day trading, but they found the picks worked as well or even better. And uh, so sometimes you get on to some of these and they just don't necessarily fit your methodology, but doesn't mean that they've turned into bad stocks. So Stuart, that one still looks pretty darn good. CLDR got stopped out and now it moves higher. That's life. Yeah, no shit, huh? I hate to, what would, what would happen if I drop? I got an F-bomb, I don't wanna break it, but let's, let's, let's drop an F-bomb. <laughs> Mike Peterson in the group, he sent me this little F bomb. I'm sure you've seen it in some of my um post. <laughs> I get this package at the front door. It's like I was scared of crap out of me. I was in the kitchen getting a little lunch or whatever. All of a sudden I heard boom on the front porch. And uh I think the FedEx guy or whoever dropped it off just threw it. You know, I guess they throw packages now. Yeah, you got knocked out of that one. Yeah, that's a bummer. But you know what? It'll it'll set up again. It'll pull back again. That's a good looking stock. Yeah, a little crazy longer term, but it's gotten its act together. It looks pretty good. Yeah, wait for the next pullback. Put that on your minimum list. Got stopped out. Now it moves higher. That's live. Confusing issue with facts question. My uncle was talking about getting it a goal. If we have rapid inflation as a result, a massive deficit. What's your thoughts? Eh, you know, it's confusing the issue with facts. You answered your own question. Now, he might be on to something, but keep in mind, things change, okay? And, you know, if you get really bored, read Intermarket Technical Analysis by John Murphy. And one thing he'll tell you is there's long and lead, there's long lead and lag cycles. And also while you're doing that, to learn a little bit about the economy, read Pring's economic cycle. But the only problem with all this stuff is there's long lead and lag cycles with the dollar, the gold, and everything else. And then sometimes the relationships invert for a long time. You have to ask yourself, can you time off of it? Okay. Two questions to ask yourself. What's that? Is it universe friendly? I think that's Einstein. And can you time off of it? So let's say your uncle's right, but early, right? Well, a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Let's say the economy tanks, God forbid, right? Well, what happens to gold? Well, gold's going to implode, right? Yeah, they're printing a lot of money. The gold people are going nuts on TV selling gold. A while back, as I've told the story before, when gold was headed higher and I was happy with gold headed higher and I was long gold stocks, my father-in-law asked my, I said my, I, t I tend to be, I tend to have a family of, of in-laws that ask me a question and then tell me how wrong I am in my answer <laughs> or, or give me the answer. But anyway, my brother-in-law, Andy, I, I, 
we uh, we call it Andean. It's like when he, he asks you a question, then tells you which, how wrong your answer is. But my father-in-law made a point. Why would they be selling it to you? And I'm like, well, because it's a high markup. You don't necessarily want to be buying gold from the guys on TV. And he kept asking the same question over and over again. And finally, I'm like, okay, well, he's obviously going to keep asking this question. So I better shut up and not ruin dinner, as I have many times, getting into arguments with my in-laws. But that's another story for another day. They don't watch my show, so I can talk about them here. And that's why I often write about them in the columns. But anyway, you know, I got to thinking about it. It's like, well, why would they be selling it? Okay. If if gold, you know, they're always like, if, if gold goes back to certain levels and we think gold is going to explode. Okay, well, why would they sell it to you? You know, why would they sell it? You know, that's he's got a point. Okay. So, yeah, I would be careful. I mean, it 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 makes for a wonderful story. But the charts don't lie. I saw somebody was talking about, and I was skimming my Facebook feed last night for Dave Landry's Trend Traders, my Facebook group, and I saw somebody was talking about the book, uh, If It's Raining in Brazil, by Starbucks, because the, the rain helps the coffee, and the coffee, you use more coffee, it's cheaper, whatever, then you can sell more coffee, whatever. Well, you know, you start connecting all these dots, and it gets kind of complicated quickly, and it makes you feel good, but the bottom line is, if you want to trade coffee, trade coffee. And if coffee's going up, buy coffee. If coffee's going, coffee's going down, buy coffee. If Starbucks is going up, buy Starbucks, you know, with some patterns. If Starbucks is going down. So it'll all be reflected in the charts. So we take a look at gold. Gold is going sideways. So I wouldn't rush out and buy gold right now. Now, gold is one of those areas, commodity related, that I do like it when it when it hits major, major lows and then makes a bow tie or something. In fact, let's just take a look at like a weekly bow tie on this. So yeah, you had a weekly bow tie back here in 2019, and it's been running higher ever since. You had a bow tie down, look at that, 2012. It bottomed out also in 2015. So use some kind of technical analysis. I guess longer term, it's still in an uptrend, so he's right for now. GMBO, we talked about that one. Okay, Chris says, I find when you remove something from the LL, sometimes it triggered but was a fake out. The next trigger sticks. You know, that's great analysis, Chris. That's that's good. And that's I'll have to watch for that. So what Chris is saying, which is kind of neat. So what's that? TBIO. So Chris is saying that, okay, let's say you had a reasonable trigger in, in TBIO this morning. And that trigger was up here or something somewhere. Okay. So he's saying a lot of times you'll get that first move as a false move. It'll come back in and then take off again. Yeah, that's fine. That's a, that's an interesting observation. And that's why I tell people to keep those older stocks in the Landry list. And what I do is my momentum list. I have a momentum list of about 350 stocks right now. And those are old Landry list stocks for the most part or stocks that could end up on the on the Landry list soon. But a lot of them are old Landry list stocks. So keep an eye on them. Elizabeth says, I asked about spot a couple of weeks ago. Did we miss a pattern or does it just not fit the methodology? All right, good. Thanks for giving me an out in case I'm wrong. Yeah, it just didn't fit the methodology, okay? So it's having a big move today, but what did it really do? Did it really pull back? No, it didn't pull back enough based on this breakout, okay? So when I do, when I look at 2000 stocks every night, when I see something like this, I'm like, hey, could I have caught this move? Should I have caught this move? And if I can't, if I don't see a pattern, then I'm, then I have to just say, well, don't worry about it, Dave. You can't kiss all the women. As I often joke, unless you're Bill Cosby with a bunch of roofies or Harvey Weinstein. And, you know, you know what happened for those guys anyway, in the badly, obviously. So, no, I wouldn't beat yourself up for missing that. I really don't see any pattern there that that could have easily been taken so you know just let it go let it go right o a p p f yeah this looks okay um it's not bad it's a little bit on the thin side but it is a hundred and something dollar stock yeah this is pretty good look stock you know, it broke out. It didn't pull all the way back to the breakout, but it did pull back deep enough. Yeah, that's good looking stock. Absolutely. Who asked about that one? Mark? Good job. 
Okay, Zach's uncle said, he also said that confidence is the only thing retaining a dollar value. Once confidence goes away, you'll want to be in gold. Well, I'm seeing a lot of people poo-pooing the dollar right now. And what's the dollar doing? Yeah, it's headed down. It's for the most part pulling back. So, you know, I hear him, but big picture things rarely work out. Themes, you know, rarely work out, at least in the time frame. And next time your uncle tells you something, Zach, just say, well, you know, it was Keynes, and find out his first name, so you'll sound a little bit more intelligent. He says, well, I think it was Keynes that once said, a market could stay irrational a lot longer than you could take, can stay solvent, okay? And I think that's something that makes a lot of sense. But yeah, if you think gold's going up and it's going up, then buy it. If you think gold is going up and it's going down, then don't buy it. Hey, you might want to write that down. Well, look, we're out of time. I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking your time. I had a busy schedule. Great show today as far as the feedback from you guys. I'm not bragging on myself, but you guys, great questions and great stock picks today. You guys are getting smarter and smarter. Pretty soon I won't have to do these shows anymore. So thank you so much. Everybody have a great weekend if we don't talk between now and then. Hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls next week. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Mark.